Welcome everyone once again to Expat Hoops. We're happy to welcome back Maurice Creek to the pod. Uh, we last caught up with him in episode 37. We talked about his career to date, uh, but at that point he had not signed to play for Mikolaev in the Ukrainian Super League. Um, and he'll take the remainder of that as we talk about what he what happened to him in Ukraine and how long it took him to get out. Yeah, and this is something that the last we sat down, uh, Mo, you were looking for a job at that point in time that you'd played multiple seasons overseas. Uh, but if you would, take us through um, the period of time from like when we sat down with you last, where um, at that point in time, you you were kind of more evaluating offers, basically the job hunt, uh, and what led to you signing in Ukraine at that point in time? And uh, were there any considerations about playing there, given like Russia, Ukraine had kind of been having some level of conflict there for a little while, that it was kind of like a, a slow, long burn. So take us through that period of time and what your what your considerations were like at that point in time. Well, at that time, I was uh, just, you know, finishing up my summer playing. And um, at that time, we didn't really have I didn't have really too many offers on the table. Um, offers were coming about but then slipping out of the way um going to other people and um coach terry who coached the younger kids of keep with keith basket um way back when i played for keith um he was the assistant coach from mikolov and uh you know we were going back and forth as far as trying to see if i should play there and um you know after a while i was just like, yeah, I'm going to – I'm just going to go ahead and sign here. I mean, I know what they're saying about, you know, the Ukraine and Russia thing, but I've been in Ukraine where, you know, a season is hit hit with COVID. And then the season before that, it was uh, somewhat of a little bit of a fight where it kind of stopped uh, Ukraine for like two weeks. Um, so, you know, when we hear about these things and – as far as the war, we didn't really think it was going to happen just because of the fact that it's always had been talked about and nothing had happened. Um, but yeah, you know, I just had to do what I had to do as far as playing basketball and getting back overseas, you know, especially um, what happened within my family household. I had to be the one to get out and, and, you know, to try to find a way to, you know, make money for me and my family and stuff like that. And this was just, just a great opportunity. And so, um, you know, you hit on it before that, again, this is something we talked about back in episode 37, that you had, you had some personal experience playing in Ukraine before. Um, and just to kind of recap that there have been other guests that we've had that have played in like the 2015 to 2022 period of time where, um, you know, there were different events going on with Russia and Ukraine, and it was always sort of a consideration, but at the same time, not a mass disruption had really occurred like the invasion. Um, so there is that. And like you said, you know, you have some family considerations and, uh, you know, you had to weigh all of that. But um, before the invasion actually happens, you sign on uh, in January of 2022 with Mikhalif. Um Take us through what it was like during that period of time prior to the invasion, how things were were actually going, and uh, kind of <laughs> when you when you first really were starting to realize, okay, that this is a little bit different than it has been in the past. Yeah, I mean, when I first got up there, everything was just fine. You know, they were a team that needed some help. Um, they were trying to make the playoff race, and I just felt like I could do that for the guys, me just being there already two years prior I already knew the majority of the teams and how teams played and stuff like that so I just felt like this would be a good opportunity to to you know to uphold myself to uh to be accountable to you know taking these win I mean getting these wins for this team and taking this team to the playoffs um but you know so after a while you know you start to hear everything you start to hear a lot more of it every day and we wasn't really hearing it at first you know no ukraine and russia are about to go to war or you know so we were hearing this stuff every day to the point where we were having meetings with the president the vice president you know everybody that was a part of the program was in the meetings just because um we were the ones you know me and the americans we, we're not from here you know what i mean we are from the United States of America where we're trying to get back to our families or get to another spot and play. Um, but, you know, 
when we were having these conversations, they weren't really taking it seriously. Um, to a point where they were just always saying that like, everything is going to be okay, everything is going to be okay. And for us, we were like, well, we're hearing this. My parents are hearing this on the other side. Um, you know, we love the game of basketball, but at the same time, we love our lives even more. You know what I mean? So to take it so lightly like they did, um, I didn't really appreciate that. You know, um, even when the war was going on and I had a job in Qatar, um, they kind of knew that I was trying to get out. Um, they knew that uh, I was aiming for another job because I was talking to my agent and I think my agent was saying the same thing to them like hey he's trying to get out um but they were insisting on me staying there you know what I mean and for me um they were trying to give me like certain things they were trying to make me do certain things to get out like buy out my contract um to a point where it was like I really wasn't taking no money back home, which I needed for, for me and my family, you know. And um, then the LOC, which is the letter of clearance, that was taking a while to get, you know what I mean? So that's easy to sign. It's just hand it here, sign it, leave. But for them, they was trying to make it seem like they were trying to play out and see if the war was actually going to go. If it did go, how long is it going to go? Uh, is the league going to come back? And this is all while I'm trying to get up out of there. So um, haven't heard from anybody since, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Not with nothing, no apology, no nothing for the, the damages and the causes that they have put me through and my family, you know? It's just like, you know, they, they promise safety, but then when it's time to, put that on upon pull upon board they are not doing what they're actually saying they're going to do and you know that's just the way of I guess overseas basketball or professional basketball but um you know so as you get older and start to realize and I mean playing in different cities and states and all that type of stuff you just start to realize that you know say everything ain't what it seems and so let's talk about that uh, ordeal that uh, you ended up being put through. So you signed with the team in January. On February 20th, just over a month later, Russia invaded. So you were in Mykolaiv. Um, a little um, geography for people who have need to know where Mykolaiv is located in Ukraine. It's uh, southeastern Ukraine. It's about 100 kilometers west of Kherson. Uh, and if anyone's been paying attention to anything that's been going on in the Ukraine conflict, you know Kherson is been one of the most fierce battlegrounds in the war. Uh, so we're only talking about you being about 100 kilometers west of that. And Mikolaev was subject to several um, attacks uh, while you were there as well. So it was a difficult situation. Uh, at that point, they were trying to cut off supply lines from the west, uh, which is where you needed to get to. And you eventually needed to get to Romania. It took you about a week and a half. Uh, so please tell us, uh, from when Russia invaded to when you got out, uh, what was going on with you? I literally was in my house all day. Um, if I had to go to the stores, I would have my a uh, couple of members from the coaching staff take me to the store. Um, but we were going right back to the house. And even when the stuff was going on, I had to go from my house to the bomb shelter, back to the house to the bomb shelter. It was just a traumatic experience. You know what I mean? For me, I've never, I see it on like movies and, you know, you hear about, you know, saying history and stuff like that. But to actually be a part of a war, to hear bombs, to hear shelling, to have to, you know, it was one time I think I had to move back and forth through the bomb shelter like three or four times throughout the night just because of how the bombs and stuff were hitting. And we didn't know where they were going to hit. You know, you didn't know where the, uh, the uh, soldiers were going to come out. You know, you didn't know anything. And just for my own safety, um, I had to keep going back and forth. But um, the sirens was going off at night. That's what alert, alerted us that, you know, it's time to go in bomb shelters and make sure that you stay in there. You know what I'm saying? If you didn't want to pass away. So, um, you know, but never 
wish that on my worst enemy because that's how bad it was. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't have enemies, but if I did have one, I wouldn't even want that person to be in this that situation for his uh family and for his sake. You know what I mean? Because even to this day, you know, I think about that. Like, I could have died. You know what for I mean? Sure. I for could have. Sure. I could you died. could have and a lot of people in that city did let's be and real could, right so and that and that just points it out right there just th for the fact that they didn't i have not heard from anybody or have not gotten any like consideration like you know what we were dead wrong for what we did or you know so we apologize to you and your family that's that's really negative and mm -hmm. um for the league, for the players that's in the league, for, for everything. Because if the roles were reversed and America was, you know saying, within a war and you bring your son or your daughter or whatever out there, you would want the best for your son or your daughter. And I just didn't think the, the president of the league did that. I didn't think the, the team, the president of the team did that. I didn't think anything of that matter. I didn't I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel no nothing. You know what I mean? I just felt like my life was more so of, oh, if he passes, you're going to chalk it to the game. And that's mm. and that's a terrible feeling to have. For sure. Um, w one thing I want to uh, do go through with you, I know there were, as you were trying to get out, you had a couple of false starts before you finally got the opportunity to, to bail and get a ride um, out of the country. Um, Take us through that ride and when you got there and when you finally got to Romania, how long did that take and what, what happened along the way? Yeah. Um, the crazy thing about it was I was talking to Eric Norberg like a, about a couple, maybe 15 minutes before I got that ride. We was planning on doing something else, but because um, my assistant coach, sister and wife was, was fleeing the country because of the war um, and his mother, um, no, his mother actually stayed. It was me, his wife, and his sister that was in the one car, and they fled the country. But um, before all that, we were just having the conversations. I might have to hijack a car and get out myself. That's how bad the mm -hmm. war actually was. But um, to get in that car and actually feel the emotions of everybody that was in that car, even the driver, the driver – you know what I'm saying, scared to death to even drive because you can just see everything, anything and everything that was on the road. You can see, like, where the bombs hit on the road and all the pavement. You can see where the sandbags are uh, are mounted up for safety. You can see people are building hills for safety with the little uh, scope in the middle, you know what I'm saying, just in case they got to shoot. Um, you can see, I've seen a lot of things I've never seen before. I've never really seen too many guns in my life, but to have so many attachments to guns, you know what I mean? For me, the actually had to pull out my passport, and I'm scared every time I pull out my passport because I'm like, man, I'm American. They could shoot me right here because they don't know no better. They don't know who I'm for. They don't know if I'm with Russia or if I'm with Ukraine. You know what I mean? They don't know my occupation or anything like that. They just know that I'm in a car with them, with Ukrainians in the car. I don't even know if the driver was Ukrainian. So... You know what I mean? For me, it's just like that's one of the most scariest things I had to go through. Just, you know what I'm saying? Seeing the tanks, seeing all the soldiers. I mean, you you looking at these kids, some of these kids are like 15 with guns in their hand having to shoot, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? For their lives and for their country uh, over just some game of, you know what I'm saying, trying to take over something, you know what I mean? And I just never understood it, but you know what I'm saying? I guess it's just not for me to understand, but um, when I got to the Moldavian border, it was, I felt the relief, but at the same time, I, it took me nine to 10 hours just to get out of the Moldavian border. And if they would have bombed the Moldavian border, you know what I'm saying? Just because it's still a part of Ukraine until you cross the border, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So you get across it. I still was scared. You know what I'm saying? I had my book bag. I had my two bags in my hand. It's raining. It's cold. People are, um, you know what I'm saying? You got, you see the kids shivering, you see, and it was terrible there. It was just like, it could have been so much easier, but they made it so much, so much more difficult than what it had to be. You know what I mean? Like the process of 
how they were doing things took longer than what it was supposed to be expected. You know what I mean? You, you got thousands of people in line. Instead of, like, just getting them in and out, getting out, in and out, they were taking their sweet old time trying to get people in the in the uh, the gates. And for the people that was in the back of the line, I mean, they could have got shot. You know what I'm saying? Like, think about it. We still in Ukraine. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, they, if, if Russia invades that area, it's nothing that we could do. And we ain't got no... You know what I'm saying? No rights to anything. Nobody in that area was pulling out any guns or anything like that. They didn't have no soldiers walking around for our safety or anything like that. So even though I was at the border, I still was terrified. For sure. Um, how long was that car ride? That car ride was, I would have to say, about a good couple, maybe three hours. Okay. About three hours. It was probably more from what, from what I could remember. I think it was more so like about a couple hours. It was mm -hmm. about a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Long couple yeah. hours. Yeah. I mean, I really, I was really scared for my life the first time I put out my passport. And he's just looking at me like, like, I don't know who you're for. And then the ladies in the back, um, you know, so my, my assistant coach's uh, uh, sister and his wife had to explain to him, like, he's a basketball player. He played here. He's trying to get out, you know what I mean? And in their language, though, because, I mean, right. obviously you could see her do like this, like a, like for basketball, but I was scared. And I'm in the front seat, you know what I mean? So I, it ain't like I'm in the back um, <clears throat> or anything like that, but I'm really in the front seat, just like, here, uh, whatever goes, goes. <laughs> like, I just, Man. it just was – a crazy experience like i said i would not wish that for anybody so i think that you kind of hit on this a little bit earlier but i'd like to expand on it because i think it's one of the things that um you know with international basketball you can have all these different situations where across the world that we may not be as familiar with it until you actually get to those areas and you realize this is a little bit more real but what would your advice be for anybody uh, in the future where things start start get where you can kind of become aware of a situation and you start going undergoing the, the consideration of should I get out of here? Looking back on it, what would your advice be? Would it be like working with your agent? You know, what what would your advice just generally be? Well, first and foremost, because I was in it, um, I start to learn, like, if I was ever to play overseas basketball again, in my contracts, it would have to be, like, if I feel threatened or if I feel into a point where, you know what I'm saying, I have to decide for my life or for basketball, we're going to have to come to some type of negotiations, and it ain't up to for no debate. But, see, the problem is with these with these contracts that these players are are signing, they're just automatically thinking that, uh, just because you're in somebody else's country, they're going to take care of you. And what you don't realize is that that ain't it. You know what I mean? They can say anything that they want to say or do whatever they want to do, but until they got to actually go through something like how I had to go through, that's not it. You know what I mean? They'll take care of you when it comes to, like, something that they can actually take care of you with, a car, an apartment, uh, something like that, money. But when you are, when your life is on the line and you're threatened with your life, how are you going to take care of me? They're going to worry about their kids and stuff before they worry about you. You know what I mean? And that's just how it was with me. Like what nobody really worried about me. It was only a couple of people in that, in that environment that was really worried. It wasn't the president. It wasn't, it was my two coaches. It was the coaching staff that kept me safe, making sure that I was getting to that bomb shelter, making sure that I was, you know what I mean? Making sure that I had food, making sure that I was going to the store so I can cook in the morning because I couldn't cook at night. You couldn't have your lights on at night. If you turn your lights on, you might get shot. You know what I mean? So um, I really learned that, you know, people can say or do whatever they want to say or do, but at the end of the day, they got to actually be able to prove that. You know what I mean? And from what I experienced, they wasn't improving. They weren't improving nothing, but making sure that they was in, you know what I'm saying, safe and sound regards and everything like that. I think, I think while I was in, while, when we had the meeting that one time, right, um, Odessa was one of the hot spots. So 
they they had already got their city bombed and mm-hmm. um I think the airport got bombed. Um because that that was like military forces as well. You know what I'm saying? They ain't want no airplanes in the air, no nothing. So they was gonna bomb that spot. So the president of the team, he was just in in Odessa, like, see, nothing's wrong and everything like that. This is two weeks before the war. And me and like the other Americans are sitting there like, dude, the war ain't start yet. Like you're talking about everything is okay as if they they are not talking, they still not talking about this type of stuff. Yeah, they were still amassing troops on the border. Like nobody had crossed over yet. And I mean that's that's just being (laughs) that's just being ignorant and trying to get their money, you know, like that's all that is. Exactly. Exactly. And even like after the war start started and I was stuck there and you know, you know saying the other Americans got out because I only played one month, probably not even one month to be honest with you, but they were already there. They had money saved up, they had everything saved up. And stuff like that. I couldn't even get out. You know what I'm saying? Like, of course, you could ask people for stuff like that, but unless you know what I'm saying, you are, you know what I'm saying, they they gotta still give that. You know what I'm saying? Some people were like, oh, you're not, you know what I'm saying? Like it, you know how it is with that type of stuff, but that's not none of nobody's responsibility, but the president of the the feder the president of the federation, the president of the organization. You know what I mean? You supposed to take you supposed to take care of your players as if they taking care of you. You know what I'm saying? Like we are, you're bringing Americans in to play in your league because you know that's how you reven, you uh, generate money. You, if you, if you have a league with all Ukrainians in it, you're not gonna really generate no money like that. You know what I'm saying? But everybody worried about their own personal gain and how they, how they feel about it until it actually has to flip back on them. You know what I'm saying? Like or it flipped back on us for that, for that matter. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if like I said, if it was us. And the roles was reversed. They would be feeling the same way that I feel right now. If it was their son or their daughter in our area, no doubt. And I don't take care. I don't take care of them. You know what I'm saying? With all open arms and everything like that. If I don't say, if your if your son is stuck in Ukraine, or if your son is stuck in America, and I'm the president of the league, it is my. I feel like it is my responsibility to make sure that everybody gets out safe and sound. And that's how you. You know what I'm saying? That's how your league gets credited. Not move on to the next year. And they're playing right now. We don't know if the war ended. You know what I'm saying? They're actually playing games right now in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Some of these teams are playing in Ukraine right now. We don't even know if the war ended. But that's just that's just the the right minds of people. They just they're money hungry and they don't worry about and they don't really care about people's lives. Because how you plan in a city or a, a country, and we haven't even and it has not even been been declared that the war has ended. You know what I'm saying? It's very it's, much not ended. It, yeah. Right. It's for greed. It's for money. And it's, I know what people are saying is, well, they're not playing in that spot. Well, it's only a couple of teams in the league that have the money to move. It's Promete, and I think it's uh, Bunavitic. Uh, um, it's like another team that's in the Kiev area. They move. Everybody else is still in the Ukraine area. So, and you got Americans out there that are risking their lives to play. So I'm, it's it's a wild situation to me. Again, like I, for me, I just did not feel how everything was going about. Like I did not feel like, I felt like they don't care. They only care about what they can, uh, what they care about that money, making sure that that thing is straight and, uh. If that basketball goes, it goes. If it don't, it don't. As long as I get my money and my revenue for what it is, that's what it is. And that's how I that ever since I came back, that's how I felt. Because like I said, nothing has happened. No apology from the president of the league. No nothing. And the crazy thing about it was is that it it dawns on me now, like that they ain't really take this uh this war seriously. Because when COVID hit, we were gone. It wasn't no, it really was no, uh, you know, it wasn't to a point where they were like, all right, we're going to wait and see what is this is going to do. Nah, when COVID hit, we were out by a week or two for everybody, though. But now a war hits and you can't get everybody out. You're not making sure that your Americans are safe and sound. It don't make no sense to me. Just want to point out that uh, very briefly that one of the things that you hit on was one of the two teams 
Promete was one that we spoke to D. Harrison about, uh, that he was playing in the Ukrainian league at that point in time. And like you said, they're a team that has resources. And what did they do? They moved around. Uh, that's another situation where I certainly encourage other people to to go to the link and check that episode out because that's eye-opening as well, where the short version is essentially they kept moving the team around, keeping them in the dark. But there again, like you said to your point, that's one of the two teams that has resources and they didn't necessarily handle it. I don't want to say ideally because it's a tough situation to manage and I will give them credit for that. But if that's the best that can be done, that's a situation that also, like you said, should kind of have alarm bells go off that, you know, that they're looking out for their particular interests. So just kind of wanted to point that out before I got off to the next question. And my next question is really kind of this. Um, you've mentioned that, you know, you've, you've had these relationships with your uh, with your assistant coach, your coaching staff, um, that they were the ones that were responsible for getting you out. Um, you know, the, the, co- the ple- people that you played with, since the period of time that you even escaped, have you been able to keep in contact with them? And what 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 sort of things are are they telling you if you have been able to keep in contact with you? Um, honestly, I really haven't. I haven't been able to contact them. Um, we had this group chat going, but because everybody kind of dispersed, the group chat ends. And so, like, for me, all I can do is, like, pray for their safety and, you know what I'm saying, pray for – um, you know, like I said, their safety because just like me, if they don't have the resources to get out, and you know, there's nothing that they can do. But nobody's helping, and that's what I think. That's where I'm kind of getting at. Nobody is helping these people. You know what I'm saying? Like I see uh, players from the Ukrainian league going to different leagues. I seen that. Um, you know what I'm saying? Over the like in that last year. People were moving to France. People were moving to Italy. People were getting these contracts. But at one point in time, they were about to have to fight. But because of they they came to terms that they're not uh, soldiers, they're basketball players and stuff like that. They were going, you know, what I'm saying they're trying to find contracts, stuff like that. They got out and started moving to different countries. My problem with that is that I still think that these people that got this all this revenue. I'm talking about, like, the Ukrainian League has been going on for how long? And you're generating so much money off of the Ukrainian League every year. Sponsorships, commercials, TV deals, all of this stuff. You can't make sure people are straight. You can't make sure people are, you know what I'm saying, are good, out of out of harm's way, or you can't uh, generate a plan to an point where – if move the league somewhere else so we can finish the league off or anything like that. You can't do that for people. That just shows me that you you're about your money and you're about the greed in the game. So I know you were talking about how your coaches were the key to you getting out. Um, I know you've talked about uh, what you've been doing since. Um, I did want to know something. I know this has been a traumatic experience for a lot of people. Um, what has it been like? And how have you seen what impact this war will have in a place that you've had a considerable amount of time, a place where people still are, as you just mentioned to us, uh, in a war that is still ongoing? What is what is that like for you? Um, you know, this this situation right here was one of the reasons I made what I made the decision to stop. You know, I tried it again, but at the same time, I stopped because of it. And um it kind of hurts that I that I stopped because of it but I just felt like you know if I can go ahead and move in a whole nother type of way you know saying give back to the kids here and be safe with my my family and my friends if something happens at least I can go to family and friends you know what I mean I don't have nobody up at the war so I mean over there and this I'm going to war and now people only can do is pray for me you know so um I just, like I said, been chilling here. I've been, I play a little bit here. I play for a TTBL team called Beltway Bombers just to stay in shape. I train kids, um, just giving back, like how people gave to me. Um, And I just stay out of the way for everything. And I've seen that that, this war actually hampered multiple people, not just me. You know what I mean? The people that even got out. I got a friend, he's in the Maryland area. 
we talked about that. You know what I'm saying? Just like how like how bad it was for the both of us. You know what I mean? Like how it hurt both of us. And he's training kids. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So he's uh and I know this hampered him too for going back overseas. Um another one of my guys, Jerome Randall, he played uh for Bonavidic and he's training kids now. So you just gotta realize and think like I don't know. I can't say that this this situation made them go and start training kids, but I do. I can say that this hurt a lot of people. You know what I mean? Yeah. And for nobody to reach out to nobody, I don't think you know what I'm saying. Not just me, but to anybody who had to deal with this type of stuff, you have not reached out. You have not done anything. Like that hurts. Yeah, and and one one point uh, in particular, uh, as you you go through this over time, uh, the not reaching out, the 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 distrust that you built up uh, against uh, management and ownership, I imagine even in a good situation, you know that's always going to be in the back of your mind that distrust that you've had over the situation, no matter who it is that you're working for. Yeah, it's just you know what I'm saying for me, like I just was always. I always look at the roles in reverse, right? So for anything that I do in life, I look at it as like, what if I was on the back burner of that? Or what if I, or what if my family, or what if, you know what I'm saying, if that happened to me, how would you, how would I feel about that? And that's what makes me make my decisions, you know what I'm saying? And in life, basketball, whatever, you know what I mean? But a lot of people don't think like that. A lot of people just like, uh, are selfish a lot of people are about greed a lot of people are about not helping others and a lot of people are about helping their own you know what I mean like it's a lot that goes into this and and so for me like if I was to start up something like I, I'm giving back to kids because now because that's what I love to do you know what I'm saying I'm that type of person you know what I mean I'm, I'm a better person than a basketball player and I was brought up to be that way you know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying everybody has to be like me, but what I will say is that, you know what I mean? Like you gotta start. If you want something, you gotta you gotta give. You know what I mean? It's not no, it's not no you get and you not giving. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And uh, what I feel like in, in that situation right there is like he got everything that he wanted and didn't give back. And we had to find our own way into stuff. You're you're kind of hitting on the collateral consequences of the war that like it still have a, has a mental impact, psychological impact on on you guys, and you guys are the ones that are relatively lucky um, in the situation it got out, right? Yeah, I mean, you gotta think about it. Think about the people who who lost somebody. You know what I'm saying? I was I was very fortunate to get out, but you gotta think about how my family was feeling. Every single day that I was stuck there, it was, I mean, from what my people were telling me, they only told me half while I was in, while I was still at Ukraine. They told me everything that they had to go through while I was in Ukraine. You know what I mean? Sleeping on shifts. They couldn't even sleep together because they had to sleep on shifts to make sure that if they hear something or whatever, or a way to get out or something like that, that they could tell me or anything like that. It was one point in time my mother could not sleep. And so I, I remember that I literally was on the phone with her all night long, all day, all night. Like she could not move, sleep, eat, none, none of that. You, you got to think about that. Type of thing. But think about the people who actually lost somebody. Mm-hmm. Think about the people who played in your league that lost somebody. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, these are the things that we don't think about. We only think about what we can gain and what we can get out of what we can do. And it's like it's no help. It's no let's let let's let's make sure everybody gets out. Let's make sure everything. You know what I'm saying? You can't help everybody. You can't help everybody for what you. But you could try. They didn't do anything. They didn't do nothing for nobody. No plan. No nothing. Like no plan. No nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like it just did not make no 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 type of sense to me. And so in that regard. People were getting stuck. People were mean. Teams were when it was like a couple of teams that I respect for what they were doing. 
You know what I'm saying? Like when they heard about it, they were getting people out. You know what I mean? Uh, like I said, Lucky, um, Lucky Jones, that's my guy. And his team, he thinks they should have been did that. When they heard about a war, they should have been stopped it. Like at least suspended the league and to the point where you take people home. But if they if it can resume back, then we got to come back. You know what I'm saying? Just to make sure we don't even remotely feel anything a part of the war. But none of that stuff happened. Nothing happened. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? We were just like, all right, we're going to wait it out and see. Okay, we're going to wait it out and see. Oh, it happened. You know what I'm saying? But and by then, it was people, already too late. It was already too late. Yep. It was already too late. Yep. Well, no, you talked about casualties. I do want to point out at the end of this podcast that uh, according to the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, over 8,000 civilians have now died from this conflict one year on. Uh, and that's not getting into, of course, soldiers and people surrounding the war effort itself that have died. It's a major traumatic event for everybody that's been involved. Uh, and we're so glad, Mo Creek, that you and everyone that came with you got out safely uh, now that you're back in the U.S. and training kids. Uh, we wish you the best, and thanks for coming on the pod to talk to us about all this. Thank you for having me. Hello, and thanks for watching. Be sure to give the video a like, and you can watch more videos over here. Uh, you can also click subscribe over here so you're notified when we have new content here on Expat Hoops.